One key cryptography was good. One key cryptography allowed us to develop automated teller machines and bank using robots rather than in line at bank branches. Two key cryptography was better. Two key cryptography allowed us to do internet commerce. So if, if one key is good and two keys are better, why don't we try three? Okay, hello, I'm Phil Han Baker, and in this presentation, I'm going to be describing the use of what I call metacryptography in the mathematical mesh. And if you look at the status bar on the bottom here, the color has changed from green in the first two to orange in the last one to red. And that's kind of like the technical level indicator. And in this particular presentation, there's no way to go around it. I'm going to have to do some math and I'm going to have to use some formulas. And this is not actually stuff that you will find in quite a few cryptography books out there. Uh, it's generally considered, you know, postgraduate type work. But I need it for the mesh, so I have to explain it to people. OK, so why are three keys better than one? Well, let's just revise why two keys are better than one. So Alice is, of course, talking to Bob. And if they're going to encrypt the message with symmetric key cryptography, Alice has to know the key. And then she sends the message to Bob. And Bob somehow needs to know the same key in order to decrypt it. Well, how did it get there? And so symmetric key cryptography only gives you a way of having a secure communication after you've had a secure communication, which, you know, is problematic. With public key cryptography, we can do it a different way. So Bob creates himself a public private key pair. So the he generates the private key first, and then that is used to divide the public key. Or, or sometimes you generate both at once, whatever. So the public key is used to encrypt. The private key is used to decrypt. And these are completely separate. Separate keys for separate roles. So because the decryption key, sorry, because the encryption key can encrypt but cannot decrypt, we can make it public. We can put it on a directory in the cloud and Alice can find it. And now Alice has a way of encrypting the document and sending it over to Bob, who can now decrypt it using her, his private key, which only he knows. Separate keys for separate roles means that we get more security, we get more flexibility. And of course, as those, as though, those of you familiar with public key cryptography know, what we actually do is that we still encrypt the document under, the, under a private key. We generate a new private symmetric key every single time we're going to send a message. And then we encrypt that random number, we call it the session key, under the public key. And the reason for that is that public key cryptography is more flexible, but it's a lot slower. So we use public key cryptography to establish a framework of trust, and then we use symmetric key cryptography to leverage that framework. Okay, so separate keys for separate roles. If we split that private key into parts, so instead of having one private key, we have one bit here and another bit here. We can do this mathematically so that both parts of the key that are held separately on separate machines 
are required to do the operation. And what's even better, if we use the techniques that I'm going to be describing in this presentation, and you know, I didn't originate them, uh, folk like Torben Pedersen, uh, Matt Blazenko invented them in the 1990s. Uh, we can show mathematically that the work factor, that's the level of security, of this split key, of both parts of the split key, is the same as the original key. So if our original work factor here was 2 to the power 128, so if the, that's the 2 to the power 128 here, then the work factor for this key will be 2 to the 128, and this key will be 2 to the 128. So splitting the key into two doesn't reduce the difficulty of the cryptographic problem. In fact, the, the difficulty of each problem is as hard as the original one, and we've got more problems to solve. So the difficulty actually goes up. So what's the advantage of splitting the keys? Well, let's look at a password vault management system. There are two basic applications for this three-key encryption. The first is to share information between devices, and the second is to share information between people. And the whole point is to have more flexibility in how that is done. So if Alice has her password vault here, and she, you know, a, the shortest password that is secure is about 16 characters, the longest one that is memorable is not much longer than eight. So you don't use password vaults because you're too lazy to remember passwords. You use password vaults because you want to use passwords that are long enough to be secure. So we have a device and, you know, if we just got one device, it's fairly simple. We can store the passwords encrypted on the device, no problem. Now what happens when we have a second device and a third? Well, now we want to be able to update the password on this one and immediately have it on these two so that our passwords can follow us round. And if we don't have that, well, we can't use the long term. You know, We're going to end up being the glue between the systems. You know, that doesn't work either. So we need some sort of password vault to remember all those passwords. And it's going to have to be in the cloud so that um, all those devices can sync to it. So you turn the device on, it syncs its password database with the cloud. Uh, you add a password, you update a password, and the database in the cloud is, in, is updated as well. Since the cloud is simply somebody else's computer, we had better encrypt this data. We don't want the cloud service provider having access to all our passwords. Which sounds great, but then, you know, how are we going to get the password between all the uh, devices? And there's, there's different ways of, that this is done. And none of the... Uh, and when I start to look on the websites, they don't seem to be awfully keen on explaining how they actually do it. So one way that seems to be done is to have a master password. So uh, this is not secure. This has got about 40 bits worth of uh, randomness. So. No, this is not a secure password. It can be brute forced. Sorry. OK, so we have that password. And then the user can use that password to populate a symmetric key to each of those devices. And that seems to be how at least one of the uh, products I looked at is doing it, you know, using symmetric crypto from the 1970s. Yeah, great. OK, so what could we do better? Well, one way that everybody suggests is, why don't you use public key cryptography? And it turns out that, yeah, you can get a bit more leverage here. 
But not as much as you would think, in that the problem is that if we use public key cryptography to encrypt this password database, well, every one of these machines is going to have to have the decryption key for the data grade base. So we now have to share a private key across all of those machines. And, you know, that's that can be done using public key cryptography techniques. And yeah, the, the mesh actually does provides that. But when you do the security analysis, you don't actually, you get a lot more complexity. And arguably, you're not getting a lot more security than the symmetric key because you're having to, the thing that you have to split across the device is the private key and it's the same for every device. And so what that means is that say we uh, stop off at an airport in some country that doesn't have rule of law and uh, our, com our laptop is confiscated. Well, now that uh, government has access to all my keys because it has it's all my passwords because that device has the private key to decrypt my password database not just now but forever into the future and so this is a really gross compromise of my entire digital life and you know this could be a really serious you know could be one of those bone saw type di dictatorships so okay so we don't want that uh, to be happening what we can do with threshold cryptography, what I've rebranded meta cryptography, is that we encrypt the, we generate a public and a private key to encrypt the data. We give each one of the devices the public key so that they can encrypt their updates. And then we give each of our devices a different split of the public key. So you've got and we put one half of those keys in the device, the other half with the cloud service. And now if I lose this device, all I need to do is to disable the other half of its key and this device cannot continue to access my password database. And so that's one of the major applications for this meta cryptography in the mesh. Uh, the other one is if we do the same thing but with users so that we can have a group of users who are authorized to read a set of documents and we can add new users to that set of documents at any time that we choose and we can remove them at any time we choose. And we don't need to change any of the docu documents that were encrypted. And the U members of the group don't need to know the membership list. And that particular application is what I want to do for an end-to-end -end encrypted web. So imagine that you've got a Facebook-like site where you can post data you can comment on data and you can interact with it in all the ways that we're familiar with on Facebook and blogs and everything else. Only all the data that is there stored in the cloud is encrypted and the cloud cannot be, the data in the cloud cannot be breached because the data isn't in the cloud. Only encrypted data and random numbers. So this is the data at rest security provided by the mesh. How does that work under the covers? Well, that's what I'm going to show you right now. But first, I need a clean board. OK, so how does all this work under the covers? Well, let's just recall how Diffie-Hellman works under the covers. Diffie-Hellman works because E to the power Alice to the power Bob equals e to the power bob to the power alice okay and of course there's mod p in there but i'm going to take those as red in this because it simplifies the math and i'll come back to that in a moment okay so what does this mean well an exponential means 
e to the power a means e times e times e times e a times. So you have e times e times e times e Okay, and e to the power b is e times e times e times e b times. And raising, so raising uh, e, to the, e to the power a to the power b means that we have this set of ae's followed by another AEs, followed by another AEs, and so on. So what we end up with is E multiplied by itself A times B times. So this E to the A to the B equals E to the A times B which is, of course, e to the b times a, because it's the same thing. And Diffie-Hellman and key exchange, what we do is that instead of doing this math in regular number space of you know, integer arithmetic, we do it in a modular field. Why do we do that? Well, an exponential function looks like this. Zoop. Okay. And the cryptography here, in order for this to be unguessable, we've got to make it so that um, Alice's public and private keys cannot be, sorry, Alice's pub private key cannot be derived from her public key. So in Diffie-Hellman, Alice's pu private key is going to be A, and her public key is going to be e to the a. And this, and since e to the a is a nice smooth curve, it's really easy to invert. Because all we do to invert a curve, find the inverse of a function, is we just tip our axes, axes over. And that's a nice smooth function. And we can use newton raphson uh, to uh, find the inverse quite easy. So what we need to do is to make it so that finding the inverse of this function is difficult. And what we do is we use modular arithmetic, modulo a prime. And so if our prime is p, this basically chops that nice smooth curve up into a sequence of jaggedy bits. And Basically, what that means is that when we, if we map out the function in um, over an extended length of time, what we end up instead of that nice smooth curve, we have it goes to naught to p minus one. It goes like yeah, it's all over the place, and so this is something that is much harder to model and invert mathematically. Okay, so this is how we do regular Diffie-Hellman. So Alice's public key, his private key is A, her public key is E to the A, Bob's public key is B, and his, sorry, private key is B, and his public key is E to the B. And all we're doing here is we're splitting up A so that a equals x plus y. And the way that we generally will do this is that we'll generate a random number for x. So that's a random number. And then we will calculate, uh, so we pick x, and then y equals uh, a minus x, mod p, of course. And so what we're doing here now is we're chopping up this so that instead of having two rectangles that are a times b, sorry, instead of having one rectangle that's a wide by b deep, 
we now have two rectangles. We've got one here, which is, so if this is X and this is Y, so this rectangle here is E to the X times B. Here we've got E to the Y times B. And as, you, and as is obvious, uh, since X plus Y equals A, this is going to be the same result. But if we have e to the x times b and e to the y times b, we can multiply them together. And so we can do this calculation here. We can do this calculation here. And then we can multiply the two results together to get the same result as if we had a single public key, single private key involved. And so what this means is that we can... Because we have x and y as separate, we can do the two parts of our calculations on two separate devices and only bring the two parts together on one of the devices, or even a completely different device at all, uh, to get the result. And so what this means is that we can have a service in the cloud who, that can control the use of decryption but cannot decrypt. And the way that we do that is that we will give the cloud computer the value X, but not the value Y. We'll give the value Y to the device. And now the device cannot decrypt unless the cloud helps. The cloud cannot decrypt because the device never will help. And so the cloud can control use of decryption, but cannot decrypt. Okay, so you're probably asking if uh, this is secure. And surprisingly enough, it turns out that it is exactly as secure as the underlying um, Diffie-Hellman system. Um, we don't degrade the work factor at all. Okay, so... Um, now, okay, let's get this clean board. So at this point, the cryptorati uh, among you are probably saying, well, that's great, but we don't use Diffie-Hellman anymore. You know, does this work in elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman? And of course, the answer is yes. Um, in elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, instead of using modular arithmetic as the way to make the math difficult to inverse, we use elliptic curve arithmetic. And this is, you know, one of those mathematical constructions that mathematic, mathematicians just love to create for themselves. And it turns out to be a really useful piece of math. And so we can, we define a function on an elliptic curve. So if P is a point X, Y, we can add P to Q via defining some mathematical operation on the curve and there's some uh, there's some math here that proves that these things are groups or whatever if certain conditions are are applied I, I won't go into that math here but you know we can maybe do it someday once you've got a way of addi defining addition we can define a scalar multiplication so that means that we can define uh, a so if we have a private key A, which is the private part, the public key in elliptic key Diffie-Hellman is A times a point on the curve. So we have A and we have A dot P. This is the public. And now we use that in exactly the same way. Alice will take her private key and Bob's public key, B dot P, and Bob will take his private key analysis public and they will both calculate a dot a times b dot p and so all we do here is again we can split a into two so that instead of it in a times b it can be x plus y b dot p that we calculate and we can calculate that in two parts we can calculate it as x b dot p 
and then add that to yb dot p. So same game again. We split the private key into two, do the two operations on two different machines, and it still works. There are a few implementation uh, issues to be addressed. Um, you, if you are doing any Edwards curve, uh, you can just do this with the regular libraries. For the Montgomery curves, you've got to go into a bit more stuff because the optimizations that we use Montgomery curves to enable, those mean that we don't implement a function adding two points together. The Montgomery ladder's doing something else, and it's a, you know that's where the point comes. So basically, we just need to undo all that optimization. Uh, you can do the Montgomery uh, math without using the Montgomery ladder and then that allows you to do define an unrestricted point addition piece and it all works and of course we can do this with the newly uh, blessed uh, CFRG elliptic curves that we've generated for for use by the ITF so we can use x25519 ed25519 or in the mesh we exclusively use the ed versions ed448 and x448 all just works so that's elliptic curve version of um, threshold cryptography or meta cryptography as i have rebranded it um, now let's get started and let's start applying it to actual applications in the next podcast i'm going to be showing you the reverse so in this one i showed you taking one key and splitting it into two. In the next one, I'm going to be showing taking two or more keys and combining them to cre create one. And that has some real advantages when it comes to key provisioning. So please like, please subscribe, and please stay on for the next podcast, which is also uh, a technical one. I'm sorry, you know, technology just sometimes comes into technology. Uh, but that's the last red one for quite a while. And, you know, let's go forward on this. Thank you very much for watching and please hit like. Thank you.